So let's open up our afternoon session of this 2021 New Year 12 step workshop, how they, how and why they work with our ACA version of the Serenity Prayer. So do you have that slide for us, Steve? Excellent, thank you. And anybody that wants to, at this point, you can still unmute yourself. So feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to join in while we say the Serenity Prayer, the ACA version. So God, God grant, grant me serenity, me serenity to, accept to accept the people, people I can cannot change. Courage, courage to change the one I can. And, and, and wisdom, wisdom to know that, that one is me. All right. Thank you very much. So I think at that point, um, we're going to spend our afternoon. We'll do a little bit of a review of the morning steps, and then we're going to continue on. So that was steps one through five, and then we'll continue on with six through 12. And we have another Q&A session when we're done going through the steps. So if you have questions, please send them in the chat or gathering them on a document so that Tim and Bob can grab them and provide answers for you. Um, as a reminder, we're accepting donations via PayPal to the ACA healing at gmail.com in PayPal. And our treasure is Abby. So you'll see her name when you go to make that donation. Um, are there any questions before we turn it over to Bob and Father Tim? I'm not seeing any hands raised. So with that, we'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you so much. I Thanks. don't have a question, Kim, but I sure want to give you and Steve a shout out. Uh, we had no idea how this was going to work out because it was our first go through for this. And Kim very graciously signed up to be the MC and a co-host. And I don't think that she realized how much work <laughs> <laughs> was going to wind up being. And you're the best, Kim. We really <laughs> appreciate you. Thank you. And you too, Steve. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do now is a quick recap of what we covered in the first half. Um, my soapbox is, it's always all about powerlessness. And so for me, if I can identify that when I'm feeling afraid, when I'm feeling ashamed, when I feel judgmental, when I feel lonely, when I feel put upon, when I feel um, enraged, when my stomach's tied up in knots and my blood pressure is through the roof, there's some powerlessness going on. When I was a little kid, I used to have the sense that everybody else had been at birth given the book of operating instructions on how to do being a human being except me. And it was only after getting into 12 step programs and specifically into um, recovery from really goofy relationships that I finally heard what Bill Wilson had said, and I'm sure I had read 117 times before, but it had never really uh, sunk in. Um, he says at the end of his chapter on the seventh step, if that degree of humility could enable us to find the grace by which such a deadly obsession, in other words, our addiction, could be banished. We could become sober, we could become abstinent, we could become free from whatever those bondages of self were that were holding us down and holding us back. Get this, then there must be hope of the same result respecting any other problem we could possibly have. So there, Bill is saying, if we choose to work the 12 steps 
on any other problem we could possibly have, we have hope of the same result from working those steps on those other problems as we have the results that we get when working, in his case, when working these steps with regard to our problem with alcohol. So for me, the key then is what's the powerlessness of right now? We have suggested that one way to look at that is our little handout on step one that has four columns. I don't think you can see this because the background, oh well, in any event, I'm powerless over. I suggest doing a first step inventory about powerlessness. And then so list the powerlessness for the last 24 hours, let's say. Um, what And then in step in column two, um, what unmanageability is occasioned by that powerlessness? And I like to add, what unmanageabilities did I invite in by not recognizing that powerlessness for what it was in that moment? Then to check to see, is this really a case of powerlessness? Or do I have some choice involved? Is there something I could change? And then, so that's putting the serenity prayer into action. And then in the fourth column, what's the payoff? What do I get for either working the step in this case or not working the step in this case? What's the payoff I get with regard to the choice that I have elected? Um, in the face of whatever the powerlessness might be. And as I have said, and will continue to say, one of the great advantages of asking what's the powerlessness of right now is that in the language of Alcoholics Anonymous, the AA Big Book says, there is one who has all power, that one is God and not Tim. And so if I can name the powerlessness, I'm immediately reminded I get to have a humongous higher power. And a way that we can check to see whether our HP is up to the challenge is to use this step two worksheet, which has on one side what God is, and on the other side what God is not. Um, the language that I use there is, how big is my higher power? And I look on this as doing a searching and fearless moral inventory of my higher power to make sure that I am dealing with a higher power rather than a lower power. And I'm reminded in the first step, if I can name the powerlessness, my higher power's first job is to be the one with all power. And then by reminding myself that I have this really humongous higher power, I also get reminded that my higher power's second job is restoration, not judgment, not condemnation, not um, ignoring, but restoration. And I really believe what I'm being restored to is what I can, I'm jumping ahead here, but deal with it, um, is what I can identify in doing a business inventory in step four. I can be restored to all that really good stuff that's always been there all along, but which I have ignored or disregarded downplayed, um, denied. Restoration is such a beautiful reality. And I believe it's waiting for me. And I believe I really need to be open to that by recognizing the powerlessness, which says, I can't do this on my own. I need us. You know, it's a we program, not W-E-E. -E, as in tiny, but a W-E as in us. And I need us. 
uh, someplace in Al Anon literature, it talks about how I can be a partner with my higher power in my own recovery. And I really like that. The us includes my higher power. And then having done this second step, I can once again make a decision, which was a real challenge at first and still is, but I can make a decision to turn will and life over to the care of this really humongous higher power whom I've demonstrated through having done a searching and fearless moral inventory of the higher power. I have demonstrated on paper that my higher power is not lacking any essential skill sets necessary to handle the challenge of Tim. And I've learned that I can choose to turn the wills and lives of other people over to the care of my higher power as well, because my higher power is big enough to handle not only the challenge of Tim, but the challenge of us, the challenge of those other folks and me all at the same time. And I also believe that it is really okay for me not to understand the higher power. Because as I've mentioned, for me, understanding can be a doorway into control or the sense of being in control. And if I'm really powerless, I am choosing to abdicate the illusion of being in control. And I don't need to be in control because I get to have a power greater than ourselves who, as my first sponsor, Gil, used to say to me, doesn't string me along just to drop me when the going gets tough. And I'm really grateful that I can have a really humongous, caring, higher power who doesn't string us along just to drop us in the midst of crises. And ha go ahead. That, um, I, I really love what you're saying right now. And one of the things that I like that you talk about is how often without making a list or inventorying the higher power, we have experiences recovering people about turning uh, things over to the care of a lower power. <laughs> Yes, I am addicted to making the decision and acting on it to turn my will and life over to the non-care of lower powers. And there are lots of lower powers in my life. For example, alcohol is a lower power. Food can be a lower power. Sex can be a lower power. Um, resentment for me is a huge lower power. Judgment is a lower power and notice all that stuff also has to do with powerlessness. Um, when I make the decision and act on it to turn my will and life over to the non-care of lower powers, I always come away feeling worse than I did before I elected to go to the, um, that lower power in the first place. I always come away feeling even more bleeding and battered, abandoned and forsaken. And today I deserve better than doing that to myself. Even if other people seem to have done that, have done that or seem to be trying to do that in my life, I deserve better than being a willing participant in that. And I can make that choice. And having done that, I get to put on my higher powers glasses so that sort of in the big picture and also in whatever the present powerlessness might happen to be, I can come to see truth. What's really going on here? When I was a kid, I believed stuff that wasn't true. Other people seem to have a vested interest in my believing stuff that wasn't true. 
So um, I get to put on the higher powers glasses so that I can come to see myself the way the higher power has always seen me so that I can come to love and accept myself the way the higher power has always loved and accepted me, which is right in the middle of the mess and not in spite of it. And then I get to do another inventory. I don't know where I put it, but um, Bob very graciously and helpfully gave us this, see, you can't see what it is, but this fourth step suggestion of looking at resentments because resentment is a huge lower power. And resentment shuts us off from the sunlight of the spirit. Resentment, along with shame, but shame is about resentment too. It's resentment against me. Um, uh, resentment is the number one killer of addicts. And that's why for me, it is so important in the midst of adversity to be able to access gratitude. And having done a business inventory, in addition to doing the resentments, in addition to looking at fears, the more fear I have discovered, the more fears I'm operating from, the smaller my higher power is. And the other way of putting that is the bigger my higher power gets, the more fearlessly and not recklessly, the more fearlessly I can approach my life. And let me tell you, that's real freedom from the bondage of self in my experience. And then having done inventories to include a business inventory, looking at assets, because that's what we get restored to in step two, I believe, as well as liabilities. And it's important to be honest about the liabilities. But for me, the only way to know the exact nature of my wrongs is to recognize that I could have been more generous instead of being a miser. I could have been more thoughtful instead of being so um, insanely self-centered. And the way I know that to be true is by having done this business inventory. Then I can share that. I can be honest with myself about it, honest with a higher power about it, and honest with another human being about it. And that for me is the beginning of real humility. Then if, I've, if I have done a business inventory, I become entirely ready to have God remove defects of character. I never understood step six until I did a business inventory and recognized, oh, of course I'm ready to have God remove defects of character because there's all this good stuff that's just waiting to come to light. And it hasn't yet because of all these defects of character. The first time I did the fourth step, you know, the search less and fearing one, my mindset was that I was in fact lower than whale poop on the bottom of the ocean. So why would I want to have God remove all these defects of character because there wasn't anything else? And nature abhors a vacuum for God's sake. How could I be ready to have God remove all these defects of character when that would mean obliteration, annihilation, the end of everything? So finally, having done a business inventory, which for me started with doing Al Anon's blueprint for progress and actually getting on paper all this really amazing potential with which my higher power blessed me. I can become entirely ready to have God remove the shortcomings, 
the defects of character. Because I know there's all this other stuff just waiting to come to light. And I remember hearing, um, I get distracted by sparkly things. So this is a distraction. We'll see if I can get back to where I was, but I'm powerless over this. In any event, um, I remember hearing a recording of Lois, Bill's wife, talking after Bill had died uh, about how somebody had asked her, okay, what's the difference between defects of character and shortcomings and um, our wrongs. And Lois laughs and she said, Bill fancied himself a writer. And there was no way he could have used the same words three times in sentences next to each other. So she said, that they're all getting at the same phenomenon. And so people can get really, really wrapped around the axle about the difference between wrongs and defects of character and shortcomings. And she said, Bill just thought it was all the same thing. So um, I like to ask God to remove the defective characters from my life but that just means that I have more work to be done in terms of working the steps. Becoming ready implies that this is a process that takes time, at least for me. It seems to imply that this is a process that takes time. And addiction is all about instant gratification. It's about a lot of other stuff, but it's about, for me, instant gratification. And so I need to surrender my script and become ready to have God remove defects of character according to God's timetable, which very often is not mine. And that takes some time. Bob. Interesting, <clears throat> Tim has been over this material before that the importance of becoming ready to turn everything over. When I have completed my list and I can most of the time easily identify shortcomings, things that really need to have some cleanup. And I learn over the course of time to list my assets in a business inventory. When I get to the point of release and turning these things over to my higher power, who <clears throat> I now have this trust in that's developed through working the first five steps, I found it interesting, Tim, I'd like to hear your comment on this too, about how in my life, some of the things that were really shortcomings for me in the beginning years, tenacity being one of them, uh, it really looked more like bullying in, in some circumstances, and most of the world doesn't appreciate bullying. Okay. And yet, when it was groomed down, when uh, I began to grow uh, a little bit, then tenacity came out of that. And tenacity is useful in helping me learn to have my feet on the ground learning that I have a voice, learning that my voice is important. So part of the process in being uh, vulnerable enough to get to this point in step six to then turn over everything in my inventory to this higher power that I don't have understanding at all. Faith in, yes, understanding in, not much will eventually, in a process that Tim will describe in more detail about the removal aspect, uh, I get back useful things. And then sometimes I'll find out that things were useful become not so useful again 
and I can repeat the process. It's phenomenal that we can start our day over anytime we want. It's the discipline for me to actually stop in my tracks and, and take the time to do it. I was taught a long time ago that I actually can do a physical process. I'm walking left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot down the path of life. And now all of a sudden, my comfort zone gets invaded. And something triggers me. And I was taught to literally turn into a metaphor to stop where I am, say that I accept this is where I am right now in this moment by stepping to the side, acknowledging that, which in essence is using the principles of these two steps, six and seven, of handing all of this over. Then I step back, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, and get on with it. In the early time of this practice, uh, I was guided to stop as many times as it took to recenter. And I thought, well, I can't do that. I'm busy, don't you know? <laughs> I have things to do. Well, when the mumbo jumbo is running around in my head, I'm not present for what's going on anyway. So this is a, a terrific practice to do. And then I said something to the man that was mentoring me about well, sometimes I've got to go two steps backwards to make one step forward. And he actually stood up and he asked me to get half the distance to him that I was and then told me, you to walk two steps backward and then one forward and then walk two steps backward and one forward and see how long it takes you to get to me so we can shake hands or hug. And of course, I'm never going to get there. So this, this, metaphor and this discipline of taking a step to the side and handing over these things is, is really a helpful, useful practice for me. Well, Bob, I, you're really onto something there in terms of what what our defects of character can be at a certain time is dependent in many cases on the situation in which we find ourselves. And any character asset can become a defect of character and vice versa, I believe. And you illustrated one that you know, stubbornness can be really annoying, but persistence can be a real uh, help in terms of not giving up when I'm in the midst of something that is really difficult and worth the effort. Be, became ready to have God remove all defects of character, for me also implies that I'm willing to step out of my comfort zone. You talked about actually doing that. When I was a kid, I learned how to navigate goofy family stuff. I like to say that um, when I was a kid, I had a big green plastic hammer and a big orange plastic screwdriver. And I mean, they were squishy. When I was three, they worked really well. I'm 64, almost 65. If I try to use that big green plastic squishy hammer today, it's not going to work. Now, does that mean that the hammer is bad? It means for me that it's not appropriate to the situation. 
It was great when I was three years old. And certain survival techniques that worked when I was three don't work now. So I need to be ready to let go of those. And that's really tough in my experience. because it's a lot easier for me to stick with what I know than to move into the unknown if I'm operating from a basis of fear. And Bill W. says that fear is a core experience of alcoholics. It's certainly a core experience of mine. So again, if I'm naming the powerlessness of the moment, I'm into the first half of the first step. I can try to avoid some of the completely optional unmanageability that will be inevitable if I don't respond well to this powerlessness. I get reminded that I have a really humongous higher power whose job is restoration. And so if I'm, and then I, remember that my higher power's other job is care so that I can feel safe. When I was young, I don't remember feeling safe very often. I don't know that I can point to an experience of feeling safe when I was a kid. I have come to recognize that that's amazingly goofy. Maybe it's because I'm working in a children's hospital and I see that we have nurses who can smile with their eyes. And that is so important for these kids who can't see their mouths because we all have, all of us staff have to wear masks all the time. So the kids cannot see facial expressions except for eyes. And I can see how these kids can key into the nursing staff smiling with their eyes. And I can, I can actually see them relax because they feel safe. And I've definitely seen it. as kids let go. And I believe I, I've been there as children have died. And I've seen what a difference it is when those kids obviously feel safe enough to let go. And for me, that feeling of safety has become a huge component of what 12 step, the practice of the 12 steps can bring about in my life. I get to feel safe around a higher power. I never did when I was a kid. If my higher power is out to get me, how likely is it that I'm gonna want to turn to make a decision, let alone do it, to turn will and life over to, the, to that higher power. And if all I know is what I learned as survival skills in the midst of a goofy family, becoming ready to have, to let go of that stuff is a huge deal. And if I've been working the first five steps, it becomes so much easier and it makes so much more sense because I know that turning over um, doesn't lead, letting go of character defects, having God remove them does not lead to annihilation.
go ahead. I was relatively new in recovery. I had to memorize my sponsorship chain of command lying up the ladder. I still remember it today. And there was a rule, sort of, that if somebody up the ladder, like your sponsor or your grand sponsor, or your great grand sponsor, and so on, was speaking at a meeting, you were supposed to go to that meeting even if you were dead. So uh, I found out that this fellow by the name of Ole Olson was chairing a meeting and I made arrangements to go uh, to this meeting. And Ole, uh, in Santa Clara County where I grew up in recovery, all the programs you got up and stood in front of the room <laughs> to share it didn't share from your from your chair which was interesting help me learn to stand on my own two feet and so Ole comes up to this podium and he says the topic of the meeting today is step six and seven i'm 31 years sober and alcoholics anonymous and not one damn one of my character defects have been removed now, whatever fog was going around in my mind at the time, I sat bolt upright because I wanted to get this information. And he said, the purpose of this for me is that they've softened. They do not come back and haunt me in the same way that they used to. And the mechanical transition of steps six to seven to first of all, have the awareness of what it is that we are going to send in a process to our higher power is very interesting because for the longest time until I got some different information, I thought that once these defects of character were removed, they weren't coming back. Oh no, that's not my experience. <laughs> So then I feel the shame around, well, what am I getting wrong? There I go back to that default mechanism. So what do I get to hear? I get to hear, Bab, make your higher power bigger. <laughs> so I can go back and use that tool to expand my list, helpful. And then what is the inventory, the business inventory that goes along with my assets so I can turn everything over. And then, I heard a different take on this whole concept of removing. Okay, so uh, I steal everything I say from Tom Weston, just to be honest. Tom steals everything from Terry Ritchie. I at least tell you that I'm stealing, just saying. Anyway, so I heard Tom explain the six and seven steps in a way I'd never heard before. And it, finally, they make good sense. They're not about annihilation either of myself, because I'm not just a seething cauldron of character defects, which when removed winds up with a, a vacuum, nor is it annihilation of the character defects. What happens is the higher power does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, which is these character defects are stumbling blocks. And the higher power, when asked, will move those stumbling blocks out of my way. I'm an addict, alcoholic, product of a goofy family situation, and I am addicted to moving those defects back in my own way. Um, Bob has just talked about defects of character softening. I think they slow down, or at least I slow down in moving them back as I get older, I don't have as much energy to do it. So what happens is the higher power moves them out of the way, making the path straight. And 
I move them back. So I have to ask God to re move them. And then because I'm addicted, I move them back. I send out engraved invitations for them to come back. So I have to again ask God to re move them. And then I move them back. Talk about insanity. So the, my experience is that the older I get, the longer I stay in recovery, the less energy I have to devote to moving some of them back. So hooray for that. However, it takes a lot of humility once again to say, okay, higher power, I've done it again. Please remove these defects of character. And by having done the, the business inventory in step four and recognize there, recognizing there's all this wonderful stuff that's always been there, I do become entirely ready to have God move these character defects out of the way. And then I move them back. Ugh. So humbly asking God to remove these defects of character affords me the opportunity to recognize once again, it's a we program. In this case, it's me and the higher power and my sponsor. I think Molly is here somewhere. Uh, Molly has 53 years sober or 54 years sober or something. Anyway, um, I need the help of others and especially the higher power in terms of the removing of character defects. It's amazing that I don't need anybody's help moving them back. What's up with that? To get them out of the way though, I need humbly to ask God to remove them. Humility is not humiliation. Humility means telling the truth. Humility means not that I'm lower than whale poop on the bottom of the ocean. That is not a humble statement. That's, an actu that's a very arrogant statement. The humble statement is, I've got character assets. I've got character defects. Humbly asking God to remove these shortcomings. Gives me hope because I have a higher power who loves me in the midst of the character defects, who loves me in the midst of these wrongs, who loves me in the midst of these shortcomings, and who loves me so much, the higher power hopes that I'll keep asking to have the defects of character removed. And that gives me a lot of hope because as I said, I'm getting older and maybe it's just that I don't have as much energy for everything else. But my experience is showing me that some of the stuff that was really blatant 40 years ago is not as blatant as often. So it's either or both the character defects are being softened and or I just don't have the energy to move them back again so that they don't need to be as often removed. One of the really important pieces of this for me is that I have a subjective calculate, calculating mind. So I will often think, well, I know what my shortcomings are. And if I have them removed now, then they're not going to be problematic. 
So the reinforcement of this re-moving them is an important new tool. And <clears throat> I've done some study about the history of the steps and how they were written, but also about Bill Wilson's life. He's a very interesting man. And he did some experimentation with LSD and some other things uh, around the 11, 12 year mark of his sobriety. And he had some challenges during those times. And when he came back, he had not only a rejuvenation of more step work, but also he began to write about emotional sobriety. He wrote a letter to an individual, which was then published in the grapevine around 1955. And I find it very interesting that not too long after that, uh, people began examining different aspects of recovery that weren't in the black and white tenets of the way that the steps are, if I only looked at them with no gray area in them. So one of the things that I learned as I began to go deeper in work in ACA and CODA was about the concept of anger, for example, because anger is mentioned in the big book as the dubious luxury of normal men. Um, I've learned in my experience that it's not a dubious luxury, it's an emotion, it's a secondary emotion. And one of the most important things that has happened to me in, in my recovery, literally, is in the use of step six and seven, and also in reading some very important information. There's a, uh, a guy that's uh, been big in ACA for many, many years, over 40 years, his name is John Lee. And he wrote a book called The Flying Boy. And he does anger workshops and he says, anger expressed appropriately equals intimacy, energy, and serenity. That can be a foreign concept for many of us. But during the course of time, I found that oftentimes when I would take on other people's stuff or in a failed marriage that I had, and I didn't get married in sobriety with the idea of getting divorced, I wanted things to work out. But at that time, I was having difficulty holding on to my voice. And I was in the beginning stages of doing uh, anger work and doing my best to learn how to express it appropriately. And the removing of the concept that it was a bad thing and that it could be placed in a position where when expressed appropriately could be useful is now extremely helpful in the wonderful relationship that I have today with my partner. Um, as I'm bumbling around, oftentimes, I don't know when I step on somebody's toes unless they say something to me. And just as important, I can't uh, stand up for myself or take care of myself unless I am humble enough to say without force that something makes me angry. It, it just simply is what it is. Um, this is a process that step six and seven have been enormously helpful to me about because uh, I, I would love to have a cup of coffee with Bill and Bob and the first hundred to see whether or not what he meant when he wrote that line in the AA Big Book was really about rage because rage is mentioned in conjunction with anger. If you Google Webster's in 1935, 1936. So um, I just find that kind of stuff fascinating. And what it teaches me is there is no limit to what I can hand over to my higher power. And if I think that there is, then I've got to get back to that gorgeous step two list where I can just expand and make my higher power bigger. It's, a, it's incredibly helpful. And you know, Bob, if we have a really big higher power, um, that means that it's easier to accept powerlessness in my experience. And it's easier to make the decision to turn will and life over to the care of a really big higher power rather than to the non-care of lower powers. So that we can put on God's glasses and find out what's going on, what's my part in it, what are my options. I can share that with somebody else, become ready to have God remove defects of character and then humbly ask him to remove them 
so that I can then look at repairing relationships with others because I've been repairing the relationship with myself and my higher power so far. And then in step eight, I can actually, having taken a look at, you know, this business inventory so that I can see the exact nature of my wrongs, then I can begin to calculate what harm have I done? And recognize that harm can look very different in different relationships, in different circumstances. And I'm going to be spiritually fit enough to make the, the list of people we've harmed and become willing to make amends to them all if I've really done the first seven steps. And I think that unless I do those first seven steps, I won't be spiritually fit to be able to figure out with my sponsor what's the nature of the harm in each of these situations that could be, well, for which I need to engage the process of setting things right. So there you have your segue into steps eight and nine, Bob. Well, when I uh, have done step six and seven, uh, every time that I've done it, and I've done many, many inventories over the years, <clears throat> I've come away from it with a, a certain sense. Um, I can feel it in endorphins. I can feel it in connection. I was so glad that early in the pandemic, I read something that someone wrote that, uh, that they posed the question, what is the opposite of addiction? It's connection. I would have answered the question, it's sobriety. It's connection. And so steps six and seven bring me to a connection that I've never known before. And when that connection has happened, then it comes, it, it places me into a position to, to take steps six and eight. And what are they about? Well, what I've learned is that they're about relationship. If I am operating under the premise that I will be okay if the world does and people in it do what I want them to do, then I am not in connection and community with my fellow man. When I looked at step eight for the first time or I was in meetings and I was hearing about people, how do you get through step eight? And then how do I develop the courage to have to do step nine? There are all kinds of different thought, thinkings about how, how do I do step eight? So I'll just share what my experience was. <clears throat> Most of my first eight step and subsequent eight steps can be found in my fourth step. When I do a fifth step with someone or when I do a fifth step with Tim, as I am going along and I'm sorting through the issues and problems of my powerlessness, and when I can accept my piece of the action as I have now learned to do with column three and column four in step one. Do I have a choice? What's the payoff? Those are things that I put myself in harm's way. In cases where I've put others in harm's way, what did I do? And then what is going to be the process to make those things right? When I become ready to look at this list that I have, I know that some people may have 
been taught or had the experience of burning a fourth step list, I'm okay with that once I've made a copy of it because I'm throwing away useful information if I don't hold on to it. And my forgetter is working 24 uh, seven. Dr. Alan Berger has a couple of books, 12 stupid things that mess up our recovery and another 12 stupid things that mess up our recovery. And he said, he says the number one addiction to people in recovery is avoidance. Well, I can relate to that. So I need to have information about how to carry forward to get into the connection with people in relationship as a part of immense. The other part of this that's really important is what is an amend? Now, I came from a shame-based background. So I wanted to take responsibility for everything that was going on. And one of the really helpful aspects of sponsorship and my relationship with Tim is that if I'm talking about something and taking on responsibility for something that really doesn't belong to me, then he can push back against that and say, is this really something that you're active with or is this something that is a choice for you? And if it's a choice, what's the payoff? So there's separation between what I really owe amends for and what I don't. When I was just four years of age, I had had my father leave the family, not once, but twice. And I was told by my mother and by her friends and church people and all the rest of the people that surrounded her comfort zone that my dad was an evildoer, a drunk, a womanizer, and so on. Many, many inventories later, many, many amends processes later, I'm now several years into recovery and I have come into the awareness that I despise my father and I've despised him for years. And in a men's group that I participated in, we were challenged to write our father's story and share it in this group. And I had a panic attack. I didn't, I, I realized I didn't know my father's story. And so I inventoried my relationship with men and my father specifically had all of this tremendous rage come to the surface only to find out through a series of events that my mother had had mental illness, including when she was carry, uh, carrying me, and that I had ripped into my father and tried to get him to send me money and all sorts of things in my life growing up, yet I didn't know his side. And I'd carried this boiling resentment for all of these years through subjective thinking of my own. And when I got through into this inventory, I was guided to say, an amend is a change. It may include an apology, but it is a change in behavior. And this change in behavior is gonna be helpful to me as well as to other people. And when I contacted my father and got connected with him, I found out that he was a pretty good guy and he had some idiosyncrasies as we all do as human beings, but he had left the relationship with my mother in no small measure because of her craziness. And he had tried his best to return her to the fold, even to the point of getting counseling and her own fears and her own life situations were, uh, challenging to the point where she couldn't do that. She was carrying too much shame. The fascinating part about this part of recovery in, in my story is that by making amends with my father, which was one of the most significant amends I ever made, he then mentored me into forgiving my mom because all that rage that I had growing up about my father transferred to my mother as I projected on her 
that she had lied to me and that literally my, my whole personality growing up had been formed by something that wasn't even accurate. And that process, the immense process to first identify what it is that I need to connect with, with other people, and then tapping back into this higher power that I have identified going back once again to my list in step two and making it bigger when I need to has given me uh, the strength to go through and make these amends one amend at a time. There are all kinds of ways to look at doing amends. Sometimes it's, it's a good idea to uh, start with myself. I need to treat myself with kindness and gentleness. If I'm hard on myself, which I can be at times, Tim says, put away the meat cleaver. He doesn't even talk about it as a club. He gives me a more graphic image so that I know, wow, I don't want to harm myself with that. I remember that sometimes the way I treat myself, if others treated me that way, I wouldn't have anything to do with them. Pia Melody and Melody Beattie 101. Don't walk down that same street if you keep stepping in the same hole all the time. So uh, when I put my own mask on, when I've gotten on that plane, I need to get my mask on because if I don't have oxygen, I can't help anybody else. Then I'm going down the list and I maybe I pick out some simple amends first so I can go to the person and say, who I am, what I'm there for, why I'm doing this. And the most important thing for me in the ninth step is to say with an honest and open heart, what can I do to make this situation right? Sometimes I've heard things that I'm not gonna do if they're harmful. So I can take that back to my sponsor and say, all right, this is what was suggested. You have any idea for an alternative? Because that percolation of resentment and say, might revert back to, well, you hurt me too, you son of a bitch. That's not why I'm there. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm there to pull out my broom and clean up my side of the street and hear what it is that I can take responsibility for from that standpoint. And my experience is that even with the most difficult amends that I never, ever, ever thought I would make, I wouldn't be capable of doing it, too scared, never find the person, they're dead. Well, that's no excuse either because I can write them a letter, get it into a feeling level. I've been taught to write with my non-dominant hand to get it to a feeling level put the person's name, no address on an envelope, put the letter to them in an envelope, put a stamp on it, put it in a mailbox. And I've had feelings around that a couple of days later when it would be a reasonable time where someone would open the letter and look at it. My responsibility to not be in addiction rather than to be in connection, the spirit and the wonderment of steps eight and nine for me. Thanks, Bob. I um, really identify and resonate with the notion that amends is about setting things right. And that's why it was important for me to learn that for me, there is no one set fits all amends. Because just as I need to know the exact nature of my wrongs, I need to know the exact nature of the harm and then craft a response unique to that harm that can somehow set things 
write. And I would go a little farther. Not only can I write a letter if somebody is dead, for example, if I have done that person harm, I really believe that the notion of karma is helpful. And so if I have put harm into the universe, I need somehow to find a way to put good into the universe, not just to balance that, but somehow to uh, be more than the harm. And I need to do this for me, not for the other person. I made the mistake of attempting to do a ninth step amends before I had done any of the first eight steps. <laughs> And oh my God, it was just a disaster, except that I didn't drink. So hooray for the higher power there. I really need to work with a sponsor so I can know the exact nature of the harm and then what my options are with regard to setting things right, if not with the person, then with the universe. I would much rather go do an amends and have the other person throw him or herself on the floor saying, oh, please forgive me. I was the one who did wrong here. And that has never happened. I just hate that. Um, so I need to be really clear what my motive is in attempting the amends and recognizing that I'm doing this amends so I will get better. Not so that the other person will get better. My hope is that might come about, but I am making the amends for my own well being because I need to do that. And I believe it's because. I need to repair the damage that I have set loose on the world because of my character defects and my self will run riot. Because I deserve better than not doing that. And so making the list of persons we've harmed is um, where this in the step starts. And a lot of people find using the fourth step inventory list to be helpful. Um, it doesn't really matter where the list comes from in my experience. What matters though is that I can honestly and ruthlessly be honest about the damage, the harm, because in harming someone else, I have damaged myself. And I deserve to allow that damage to be healed. And I believe that I need to take action that demonstrates to myself my willingness to become the person I deserve to be. And that's irrespective of whatever other part the person um, who's the object of this amends, it's irrespective of whatever else they did or didn't do, said or didn't say, it's not about them and their response. It's about me doing what I need to do for me to become free, to become the person I deserve to be. And I really believe that the notion of karma is helpful there because even if the person is dead, I can determine with my sponsor the exact nature of the harm, and then come up with a plan to try to 
uh, not just cover it, but put more good into the universe than the evil I introduced because I think that's what I deserve to do for me. And there's a relevance with that about how one makes amends. In the beginning, I found that uh, I was reluctant to make some of the deeper amends because I was carrying shame about some of the actions that I'd taken in relationships over the course of years. There's a guy that um, I really have a lot of respect for. I still get so much out of his uh, YouTube tapes. His name is Bob Earl. He passed last a year before last. And Bob Earl uh, talked about step nine at a conference one time. And he said, I don't agree with this part in black and white thinking about except when to do so would injure them or others. How in the world do I know how much damage there is? So how do you protect not wanting to talk about sensitive information with someone that could cause them harm? Mm -hmm. And the way that he described that is that when going to make amends and you have found a person that you're going to ask if you can have time with, you make some statement that could sound like this. Uh, Tim, I know that we have some history that was really, really difficult between the two of us. Uh, some of this caused some really, really tough feelings. And I don't want to bring up anything to you that would be harmful. Mm -hmm. So uh, my purpose here is to say, this is what I've done. I've learned that this was wrong. I'm correcting this with my new behavior and I'm willing to listen to anything that you have to say because I cannot block feelings about what I did and truly then get them to a point where I can continue to have, ask my higher powers help to re remove, soften them, take them so they don't do me harm. Mm -hmm. Beneficial to the person that I'm making the amends to, beneficial to myself. And for those of us that are in ACA, really beneficial to our inner child and our inner adolescent. One of the things that I, along those lines, Bob, one of the things I've found helpful is to ask the person, please help me to set this right. Because my idea of what setting things right may be completely um, different from what actually could set things right. So I need to have the humility to be able to go to the person and say, I want to set things right. This is how I understand what went on. Please help me to do whatever is necessary so that things are set right. Step 10 then becomes a more easily adaptable process when we do eight and nine, at least it was for me. Uh, one of the things that I was afraid of when I came into recovery was my own conscience. I mean, I knew it was there, but alcohol, drugs, acting out, whatever, had removed that sometimes. And my conscience, conscious and conscience began to become more awake. So as I'm 
maneuvering around on a daily basis. When I wake up in the morning, I would like to say that after 32 years, I have got a lot of pure altruism <laughs> running around <laughs> in my consciousness all the time. But I wake up thinking about me. What do I have to do for work? How's things going with Beth? Do I take the dog for a run in the morning or later on in the afternoon? And sometimes if my agenda is such that I'm driven, which I can be from time to time, then uh, I may create some harm where it is not my intent. And because I have learned this relationship-oriented behavior by working, taking steps eight and nine, I count on my conscience to kick in. And if I override that, it's really uncomfortable. Oh, I see Sheila smiling and nodding her head. So I'll talk to her and just say, you know, if I did something that offended Sheila, by golly, I've got to say something about it quick. Not put it off till seven o'clock. There might be a basketball game on for Christ's sake. And then I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> and that's not the intent of the step at all. So uh, the promptly part is important for me. Tim? I'm really grateful that the step says, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admit it, not if we're wrong. Because I look on this as sort of, uh, in a metaphor you might appreciate, Bob, uh, baseball players who have a 275 average, it's pretty good. Certainly if they have a three batting 300 is a really good average. And that means that 70% of the time they've messed up. And I think that my life is like that. I'm assuming that I'm going to fall short. And that's okay. That's part of how life goes. When I'm wrong, I need promptly to admit it. And I figure that if I am on the lookout for the powerlessness du jour, it means I'm paying attention to my experience. And the more I pay attention to my experience, the easier it is later to review that experience because I've noted it along the way. And when I do a 10th step inventory, I always start with gratitude. Uh, first and foremost, gratitude for recovery, for the ability not to live my life the way that I once did, uh, which was sort of getting by, but not didn't feel much like living. And then I ask the higher power to be able to put on the higher powers glasses so that I can come to see my day the way my higher power saw my day so that I can come to love and accept myself in the midst of what went on the way my higher power loves and accepts me, which is unconditionally so that I can be honest where I have fallen short of the mark where I have introduced harm into my life or somebody else's life so that I can then come to see, okay, how can I set this stuff right? And then I finish up my 10th step with gratitude again and humbly asking the higher power to continue to help me trudge this road of happy destiny in the company of others. Because as you mentioned, Bob, the 
opposite of addiction is connection. When I was drinking and using, I felt really, really, really isolated and alone. And I'd sit there in my room with the shades drawn and the lights low and really pathetic, sad music playing. And I would sit there and drink and drug at you. Um, and I don't ever want to go back to that place again. So I believe that grateful people don't drink or use. And the 10th step for me is my opportunity um, to reinforce my gratitude for the actions of a power greater than ourselves over the course of my day. And that's why I really believe that the 10th step, oh, um, I had been going to say this earlier on, I've heard people say you can only do one fourth step. You can't ever do another fourth step. I don't quite understand that. I really believe that more has been revealed to me as I have trudged this road of happy destiny and without rehashing what I've already covered in a fourth step, unless I've come to view it in a new light. Nonetheless, I mean, that then it's okay to look back at other stuff, but I have learned about stuff that needed fourth step involvement um, and then a fifth step as I have continued on in the program. And so I've heard people say, well, you know, everything, once you do the fourth step, then everything can be taken care of with the 10th step. That has not been my experience. I need a 10th step on a daily basis. In fact, the founder of the religious order that I belonged to, that I belong to uh, back in the 16th century of the common era, suggested that we do is a 10th step at least twice a day. He called it an examine or the examination of consciousness. And so for me, if I've really done the first nine steps, I'm spiritually fit enough to do the 10th step in a really helpful and healthy way that reinforces my spiritual health. And I believe equips me to move into the 11th and then the 12th step in ways that are um, conducive to my building on the spiritual experiences that I've been having along the way and conducive to improving when I get to the 11th step, improving conscious contact because I've established it by working the first nine steps. And in that 10th step, I can remind myself of the fact that the higher power is doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. And like I said earlier, on my third overseas deployment, which should have been easy, but wound up being for me an experience from the pits of hell itself, I realized that G-O-D had to be gratitude or death because I knew my soul was going to die if I stayed as grumpy as I was in the midst of circumstances that were beyond my control and were really, really, really awful. And the 10th step helped me to keep my gratitude alive.
So I'm very grateful. I guess that's redundant. Well, I'm powerless over my gratitude. There's a lot of different um, suggested ways to do a 10th step. Some of us will write a 10th step every day. Uh, meditation, which will be the next discussion and the next step, I found that it was really difficult for me to get into that, but it's a, such a useful tool for contemplation for the practice of step 10. So it's something that I can do in the morning. It's also something that I can do in the evening before I retire, just to think through the events of the day. And was there some time when I left my broom in the closet and I didn't bring it with me in case I had something I needed to sweep up. So just the practice of awareness, being aware of my surroundings, being aware of how I feel, my feeling level about how I've participated in the day is uh, something that is, is a good guidepost for me to be in the practice of, of step 10 during my waking hours. So as we now move on to the 11th step, um, Tim and I discussed this and he's going to talk about this. I actually have been taught a really nice guided meditation that doesn't take too long. So we'll discuss the 11th step and then we'll spend uh, four, three, four minutes, five minutes, maybe at the most doing a guided meditation before we move on into step 12. Okay, so the 11th step says sought, sought through prayer and medica medication, <laughs> meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. Now there is a lot to that step. So first of all, we sought through prayer and meditation, it doesn't say we found. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. And um, seeking through prayer and meditation, a lot of people can get wrapped around the axle about, well, what's the difference between prayer and meditation? And there are lots and lots and lots of books that have been written about this. My rule of thumb is, if it works, don't fix it. So years ago, I was teaching biology and living in a community with other folks from this religious order I belong to. And one of the guys in the community got a phone call from one of his friends in the Irish mafia in this city. And um, <laughs> he told Ray, you should call Tim. So the point was, Ray's son was once again arrested as a consequence of his drinking and using. And this time he had been uh, incarcerated in a lockdown treatment facility and was having trouble with the higher power thing. So he needed to talk to a Catholic priest. <laughs> so I asked Ray, how did you get my number? Oh, well, I talked to John and he said to call you. So anyway, the long and the short of it is, it took me six weeks to get permission to get into the place and be able to get out of the place on the same day. So in the meantime, Ray got mad at me because he said I was, anyway. So I go there and Michael, the son, uh, met with me and I decided I would put on my little priest outfit just because. So I put on my priest outfit and I went in there 
And Michael is going on and on and on and on. And please excuse my French. But I said, shut the fuck up. And I'm wearing my priest outfit. It got his attention. And I said, here's what you're going to do. The only prayer you are going to pray in the morning is help. The only prayer you are going to pray in the evening is thanks. The only prayers you are going to pray during the course of a day, even at a meeting, is, will be help or thanks. That's it. No Lord's Prayer, no anything else. You're just going to say help and you're just going to pray thanks. I really believe that those are two of the three best prayers ever. The third being, wow. Uh, Bob and I have a friend, Annie L., who is a writer, and she even published a book, Help, Thanks, Wow. One of the great spiritual classics of our time. Prayer basically tells the truth. And for an addict, for somebody from a goofy family, help is one of the best prayers there is. Part of the goofiness of my family situation was I learned that I couldn't rely on anybody but me. That was an unfortunate bit of learning. And I learned that if I could only rely on me, why would I ever have to say thanks? Again, unfortunate, I would say poisonous pedagogy. So for me, prayer is really simple, help and thanks. Meditation for me is just breathing. That's it, just breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth and attempting in that process to be present to that process. That's it. I did an advanced degree in a rather well-known research university in brain biology. And even though my research didn't have anything to do with meditation, it had to do with stress. I had been introduced to mindful breathing practices in the early 80s. And if ever, while I was working on this doctorate, um, mindfulness stuff or meditation came up, the received wisdom among neuroscientists was these people are idiots they're delusional. This is complete nonsense. I finished my degree in 98. Since that time, it's amazing how many research projects have had data published in reputable, scientific, peer-reviewed, journals indicating that what these folks who practice meditation had been saying is in fact not delusional and that the human physiology is benefited by 20 minutes a day, even just 20 minutes a day of nothing more than mindful breathing. That is to say, in through the nose, 
out through the mouth. And what's wonderful about that is that something as simple as help, thanks, and wow, on its own, can help me improve conscious contact with a power greater than myself. Something as simple as mindful breathing on its own can help me relax enough to be open to an improvement in my conscious contact with a power greater than myself. If I put them together, my experiences, they seem to synergize. They seem to yield better results than either on the own. Just my opinion, but again, because it's mine, it's correct. <laughs> Another um, thing I've learned about prayer and meditation comes from a book that I mentioned before, A New Pair of Glasses, which was written by Chuck Chamberlain. Uh, he's the fellow that coined Uncover, Discover, Discard. He also said that every conscious thought is a prayer. That lends credibility to watch out what you pray for sometimes. And that every time we listen is a meditation. So when I am wanting to, uh, when I am wanting to be one of the people that is connected in prayer and meditation, then it is a practice for me to really pay attention when I'm delivering a message of my needs to Tim or listening to the message of needs from a sponsee and my partner. This whole process of communication within the steps has made so much of a difference in my relationship with Beth now because I've become more of an active listener. And if I'm rumbling around in my own head about the way things need to be right, or even worse, if I'm praying to my higher power, well, if you do this for me, then everything's going to be okay. <clears throat> Wrong. It takes my action out of the equation, the necessary action for me. So uh, how are we doing on time? Let's see. Do you have anything more on step 11 that you'd like to share, Tim, or we could do a guided meditation now and then take a little break and then do, uh, or we'll take a little break, do the guided meditation. What do you think of that? A little break. Why don't we take a five minute break and then we'll do a, uh, a guided meditation and then wrap up with step 12 and get into Q and A. Sounds great. I've got uh, two forty. We'll reconvene at 2.45. Sounds good. Thanks.
Okay, I'll wait just a minute or so for Tim to get back. And what we're gonna do is if you can be in a seated position so your feet are firmly on the floor, have a space where you can have a straight back. If this doesn't work for you or it's uncomfortable, any kind of position that you feel comfortable in will be absolutely fine. Go for it, Bob. Okay, thank you, Tim. So one of my mentors is a fellow by the name of Herb Kagan. Some of you know Herb, some of you may have taken his workshops. He has terrific uh, information on the steps. And when he gets to this part of his presentations for step 11, he's got the most wonderful sounding gong. And uh, I don't have a gong and I'm not gonna look up or Google the sound of a gong. So we'll, we'll just begin <laughs> with the imagination that there's a gong. So get centered. I will open my hands either in an open position like this or holding my fingers like this to create an internal centering connection and put them down on my knees. And we're gonna get centered. And prepare to have a relationship with the higher power that we are learning about and either understand or don't understand. And why don't we take a minute now to begin and close our eyes and breathe in through our nostrils and breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And now silently for a period in, out. Now with our feet on the ground, we're establishing a connection with Mother Earth and allowing the blue light and the warm energy of Mother Earth to come up through our feet and create an anchoring. And now I'm opening my mind and welcoming my higher power in to bring white light from its origin. And the white light will carry healing energy, energy of removal and presence in through our open minds swirling around our brains down through our eyes and behind our eyes through our face beginning to take with it all negative thoughts, all apprehension, all uncertainty, swirling down our spines, picking up areas of 
anxiety or tension all the way down to the base and then turning around and coming back toward the origin. Now as the light continues down our neck, over our shoulders, down into our arms, over our elbows, lower arms, wrists, into our hands, taking with it all negative energy, all apprehension, all anxiety, self-doubt, moving and carrying it along, back now into our bodies, around our hearts and our vital organs, asking for layers of protection, searching for connection to the blue light of Mother Earth. Now down through our center chakra, into our upper legs, down over our knees, over our calves and ankles, into our feet, blending and integrating with the blue light, now combining the energy to begin to carry all apprehension, anxiety, negative energy up through our bodies to an area around our lungs where we will blow out all of this anxiety, negative energy, fear, trepidation in small breaths to an inch above our mouths outside of our bodies. It sounds like this. <sighs> Now asking our higher power to help us take our hands and lift them up, encircle this energy, roll it into a ball, take a box that is placed alongside and put that energy into a box and close the box. And by turning our hands over, we'll blow it up into the space to our higher power to do with it as our higher power will. <sighs> now we welcome our teachers, angels, guardians, guides, that which is groomed in what we know as intuition the wow of the help, thanks, wow prayer. Thank, thanking each other for the presence of connection. And with that we say, Amen. Thank you so much, Bob. That was awesome. Well, thank you, Tim. So that is a meditation practice I learned from Beth, who learned it from a teacher, a healer that she works with.
and I have found it to be extremely helpful. There are many different ways of praying. There are many different ways of meditating. The important thing is to go where you're fed. If it works, don't fix it. Just do it. Nike's onto something there. Just do it. One way to start meditating is to give oneself the permission for one minute at some point in the day, set an alarm, one minute to simply sit and breathe. And do that for several weeks. Then give yourself permission to make it 90 seconds or two minutes. If I tell myself I'm going to start levitating today, it's not going to happen. But if I tell myself I can do one minute today, it can happen and it will happen if we give ourselves permission to do it. Same thing with praying. Help. Spectacular prayer. Thanks. Spectacular prayer. Wow unbelievably spectacular prayer. Try it. You know, see if you can do mindful breathing a minute a day for a month. If you're not completely satisfied, I will gladly refund your misery. And you know, if we work the first 11 steps, and I try to start with step one, multiple times a day, because multiple times a day I experience powerlessnesses. And as I've said, I'm addicted to inviting completely optional and therefore unhelpful unmanageability into situations if I'm not recognizing the powerlessness that's really going on. Then I get reminded that I've got a higher power who's really, really, really big not lacking any essential skill sets and whose job is restoration and I really want to be restored. And then I can make the decision to turn will and life over to the care of that really humongous, restorative, caring galoot of divine presence as Annie L has written. Um, and I can do that for other people as well. Now, somebody asked me a question in the chat about, well, what about turning the wills and lives of other people over to their higher power? I personally don't know if their higher power is up to the task. I know that mine is. So I choose to turn their wills and lives over to the care of my higher power. And I actually feel a little subversive in doing that, especially if I know they don't believe in a higher power. In any event, um, then I can put on God's glasses and ask what's going on, what's my part in it, what are my options. I can check with somebody else, uh, preferably somebody in the program, to make sure that I'm not just one more time pulling the wool over my eyes. Um, and then I can become willing to have God remove the defects of character that have come to light as a consequence of this little fourth step that I've just done. And I can become humble enough to ask God to remove those defects of character out of my way that I have invited back. And then if necessary, I can look to see, okay, have I caused harm? If so, what's the exact nature of that harm? So that in concert with my sponsor, or at least someone else in the program, I can figure out what is going to set things right and as a consequence of doing all of that in the course of my day, I have established contact with my higher power. In the 10th step, I can reinforce that contact by saying thanks, help me to see what's going on, reviewing the day, figuring out if I need to make amends, if so, planning what the amends are going to be, and then saying thanks again and I can improve on the higher power, uh, the contact with the higher power through prayer and meditation, help, thanks, wow, breathing. Those are just 
very simple ones. There are plenty more. Um, a lot of people find the higher power through reading stuff, sacred writings. A lot of people find higher power through going to mountaintops or to seashores or to the desert, to beautiful places, geographically speaking. Some people find higher power through the, the wonders and awe in art, visual arts, musical art, poetry. And some people find conscious contact with a power greater than themselves by getting together either through Zoom these days or in person if that's safe and attempting to trudge a road of happy desity, destiny together. And having done that, we have had a spiritual awakening. And the program says that having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we sought to practice these principles. We sought to carry the message and practice these principles in all areas of our lives. Since I'm in recovery from my sex and love addiction, I'm not having affairs anymore. So I seek to practice these principles in all areas of my life rather than in my affairs. Though I suppose if I were still having affairs, maybe I could stop doing so if I were to practice these principles in those affairs, who knows? Um, I don't wanna get into analysis paralysis over that. Uh, some people can get bent out of shape with regard to, well, what are the principles we're supposed to be practicing? And they'll come up with honesty, you know, lots of words. I like to keep things really simple. The 12 step says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of steps, we sought to practice these principles. And I read that to mean steps. And Bill is really clear. I read it at the beginning. Bill is really clear that, let me read it again. Um, at the end of his treatment of step seven, if that degree of humility could enable us to find the grace by which such a deadly obsession could be banished. In other words, um, that our addiction could be held in check whether it's to alcohol, other mood altering chemicals, uh, food, uh, other behaviors, sex and love addiction, gambling, whatever, then there must be hope of the same result respecting any other problem we could possibly have. He says right there, work the steps in other areas, in other problem areas of our life. And I believe that when Tom W. from Oakland says, if you're not, at least for people in California, if you're not in at least three 12 step programs, you're still in denial. Um, I think he's onto something there because I have powerlessnesses. Well, before going to Iraq without a weapon, I thought I knew what the powerlessnesses in my life were. Boy, did I discover new ones. And then before going to work at Children's Hospital, I thought I knew what the powerlessnesses of my life were. And boy, was I wrong about that. I hadn't been there even two days and my traumatic stress injuries from Iraq or elsewhere and elsewhere began to act out. And um, so I really believe that for me, it's always all about powerlessness. And the good news in that is the 12 steps work. It seemed, at least the 12 steps seem to work for an awful lot of the people I know, and I know they work for me. So I'm grateful that this is the program of attraction. 
rather than promotion. And I hope that as a consequence of um, Bob and me doing this today, that folks who have been participating have found an attraction to working steps that will prove helpful in your lives. So when Tim and I have done this workshop before, sometimes we'll run into situations where uh, we may see things just slightly differently. And when he was just sharing about attraction rather than promotion, my experience has become in the meetings that I find the program to be attraction and promotion. Not promotion in the sense that it's a driving pitch like a used car salesman, but I am so happy to see my sister, Carol P, on the screen and glad that she came in here. I was up in Lake Tahoe in the late 70s and uh, she appeared on my doorstep one day and <clears throat> announced as I was getting ready to go to the bar that she was an Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> that terrified me because I didn't think she drank anywhere near the same way that I drank. And if she thought she was an alcoholic, what in the hell did that make me? So she did things like call me on her first birthday and I'd answer the phone and she'd say, hi, Bob, I have a year sober. And I'd put the phone to the side and look at it and say, what? in the hell are you calling me about that for? By year three, she'd call and her life had changed dramatically and I was in pain. And I wasn't holding the phone away looking at it strangely anymore. I had a hold of my lip to bite on it to the point where it would bleed because I couldn't bring myself to say, tell me about this. I need more information. And when I finally got to the point where I bottomed out in recovery, over the course of time at a Thanksgiving dinner that my mother would have as a big family production every year, my sister and one of my cousins were talking across the room and one of them must have said something like, uh, keep it simple. And the other one said, are you a friend of Bill W? And then there were two of them in the room. And that was even more nuts producing to me. Um, when my disease went from fun, then fun plus problems to nothing but problems, uh, I had a aborted suicide attempt. That's a story all on its own. Some of you know it. And something that came to me was to eventually call my sister and admit that I was an alcoholic. And I tried to say I was busy that night and she had none of that. And she got a hold of somebody that she knew, Harry T in San Jose. And she coerced me <laughs> into meeting him at 400 West Campbell in Campbell, California, where I walked into my first meeting. I was instructed when I met my sponsor shortly thereafter to go to a book meeting, a step meeting, a social meeting, a men's meeting, and a speaker meeting every week. Would I agree to do that? Well, he's my sponsor, so I agreed to do it. One of the greatest values about speaker meetings is that we hear a pitch, which I consider a promotion. And in my early days of recovery, I had a job where I delivered products and I had stacks of recovery tapes that I listened to maybe four or five tapes a day and got tons and tons of information. And as we all know, being around the program, there are often times that uh, we can be entertained or we can get deep spiritual messages. Often when we go to conferences, there'll be a 
an opening speaker that's got a lot of pizzazz on Friday night and another one on Saturday and a spiritual closing speaker on Sunday. So um, I think it's so beautiful that there's a wrench for every nut in the program and um, that um, I can say something with uh, Tim where, where we may be in a position to agree to disagree and yet I love him so much because he's uh, an anchor for me and he he brings me information that helps me to be in a position to take action that I don't yet believe in and carry the message. And one of the most important things that I've learned from Tom W, uh, there's a couple of them that are very simple. One is to say hello and I say hello again to all of you that have come to be with us today and take what you like and need and leave the rest. This has been a completely joyous experience for me and something that I can say that, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm just happy to share ex experience, strength and hope and happy to be connected to Tim and happy to be connected to you. Tim? Thank you, Thank you Bob. So. Uh, what I want to do uh, to wrap up our part of this before the Q&A is to share with you um, a kind of 11th step meditation that I really like a lot. I believe this woman, if she's not in the program, she doesn't need to be. So um, this is called Grateful. Uh, it's being sung, uh, it was written and is being sung by a woman named Amanda McBroom. I've got the uh, words, so you should be able to see them. I majored undergrad in music and I was drinking at the time. The music, I believe, kept me from going completely insane. I feel truly blessed and duly grateful. So thank you for letting me participate today. And me as well. So I think we have question and answer, right? Okay. Can we have that written about one person talk to another until action? Question mark. Sarah G, I'm not sure what that means. Hmm. Oh, I, I know what it is. Yes. Okay. Like that in chat. Go ahead, Tim. No, no, I'm not sure what that means. So no, I mean, I'll write it in the chat. Oh, oh, okay, great. All right. So the next question then is, how do you get out of the loop of shame and fear of judgment and abandonment that keeps me from connecting, opening up to fellow travelers and speaking at meetings? Ah, that is a spectacular question. Thank you so much, Kay, for having asked that question. So when I came to the program, I felt so much shame. I felt as though I didn't really belong. And for years into AA, I believed deep in my broken brain that because I didn't wind up living under the bridge someplace, I didn't really belong at AA. And that's because when I heard people say, no matter how far down the scale we've gone, we'll see how our benefit or how our experience can benefit others. What I heard was only the people under the bridge are the real alcoholics. And then I had the spiritual awakening that said, you know what? I reached bottom when I put down the shovel and stopped digging. So I belong. And the not sharing was about fear. And that's because I didn't have a big enough higher power. So today, the only opinion of mine that matters 
other than myself, my own opinion of me, is my higher powers opinion of me. And my higher powers opinion of me is sober. So by, oh, and then also by recognizing that when I'm sharing at meetings, I'm not sharing to get a response from other people. I am trying to save my sorry ass. <laughs> and so when I share at a meeting, it is completely selfish in the best sense of that word. It is me putting on the um, air mask on the plane when there's a loss of cabin pressure so that I get to stay conscious. And I encourage if you're having trouble sharing at meetings because of fear of being judged, borrow my higher power and recognize that the reason to share at meetings, my reason to share at meetings is to save my sorry ass. If other people benefit from it, great. If not, great. As long as I don't drink before I speak, while I'm speaking, or after I speak, it's a triumph. So I hope that helps. If your higher power isn't big enough to allow you to act fearlessly in that regard, please borrow mine. And June also had a question for you. I'll answer Monique's question. What was the name of the book author and the Anger Workshop. Uh, the author's name is John Lee, L-E-E. -E. One of his early books in the 80s was The Flying Boy. Originally, that was written for men. It defined the difference between detachment and disassociation. And subsequent to that, he's written a lot of really important work on anger and healthy expression of anger. And then later on, he talked about the flying boy being for equally for women as well as men. It's still out there and a popular resource tool. Uh, I find it very helpful, John Lee. And his, some of his um, information is, is also on YouTube. Thank you, Bob. Okay, so June, I've heard others say, turn others to their higher power. I like Tim's take that we can turn them over to our higher power. Is that just semantics? Semantics. I believe it's actually um, a very different thing. And I, I believe that my higher power is up to whatever challenge may be there. I don't know if their higher power is. So that's why I like to turn their life and will over to the care of my higher power because I figure that I don't have to worry that, well, I don't have to be concerned that it's not gonna work. Does that make sense? Bob, why don't you do um, Beth's question there, please? Yes, this, um... This quote, uh, Bob Earl, who I mentioned, and John Lee were buddies, and they did a lot of workshops together. There was a group uh, that was running around in the 80s and the early 90s called Life Balance. And uh, familiar names were a part of the Life Balance process. Uh, Raquel Lerner, Melody Beatty, Pia Melody, John Bradshaw, Patrick Carnes. Uh, Stephanie Brown, people that some of you that are in ACA or CODA uh, and AA might be familiar with. So uh, the first life balance workshop I went to was in 1991. Bob Rowell was the kickoff speaker. And he covered this, um, this statement, anger expressed appropriately equals intimacy, energy, and serenity, which it uh, turned out to be something that he and John Lee were working on together. Anger expressed appropriately equals intimacy, energy, and serenity. Now, we have a friend in here, uh, Sherry, who is really close to 
my sweetie pie, Beth. And about nine years ago, I was having some real frustration and anger. And I was not always expressing my anger in, a, in an appropriate way. And what happened as a result of that was Beth got scared and she wanted to have a respite. And she very graciously, Sherry and her husband, welcomed her into their home. Now, 24 hours after that happened, I was completely freaked out. What have I done now? She's running away. I'm never going to see her again. When am I ever going to learn? Shame and guilt and so on was coming up in spades. And I got back into the work around anger, and this is something that we covered in our therapy sessions. Today, things are vastly different for us. She can easily confront issues with me, and I can confront issues with her. If I say, Beth, I'm angry, I feel this way when something happens. I'm not attacking her. I'm talking about the problem or the issue. And when I do that, she has an alert that something's bothering me. More important on my side of the street, when I've got my broom handy, is that when she says something to me about her being angry, it is her way of expressing something that unfortunately I may not even know. I don't get up in the morning wanting to piss her off or uh, have a, a conflict with anybody in my life. And until I began to learn to express anger in an appropriate manner, it would be something that would include either I was being triggered, someone else was being triggered, and it takes practice. There is no substitute in my mind for inner circle people, which we develop, it's small core group people in our lives, where these kinds of things can be discussed in safe and open forum, because anger is is and can be very horrifying to many of us uh, because it, oftentimes it equates as rage when it's just anger. So it's a, it's a practice that takes a long time and I don't always get it right. But when I hear ouch from somebody, I look for the spiritual duct tape to put over my mouth and assess what's going on with me and what is the intensity of what I'm, I'm trying to deliver? I hope that helps. So I got a question um, that in part says, uh, okay, how can I make amends for something I did because of how they treated me in the first place? And I think that's a really important question to be asking because in my experience how they treated me led me to believe that i was um you know and i'm talking about uh somebody in my you know in my teens for example or early 20s how they treated me I thought did not give me a choice in terms of my response. And therefore they were responsible not only for my feelings, but also for my actions. And that is not how things work. I have since learned. So even though it felt as though I didn't have any other options with regard to my behavior, I actually did. And so I need to try to set things right in that situation, even if they don't recognize that they did anything wrong, because that's not the point of doing the amends. The point of doing the amends is for me to make sure that I become the person I deserve to be. And even when other people, perhaps especially when other people are doing their damnedest 
to try to tear me down. I do not have to respond in hateful, vituperative, mean, nasty, vindictive ways. That would be my default way of behaving. But since the program, I realize even in the midst of the worst they can do, I deserve better than becoming them. So how to make amends in that situation, I'm not sure. That's where working with a sponsor will be really helpful. What I am sure of is that there is probably a way for you to set things right such that you will grow as a person from that having set things right and you will become more the person you deserve to be. I hope that helps. Lori, the uh, five types of meetings to attend are a book meeting, a step meeting, a speaker dis discussion or social meeting, um, a speaker meeting. Oh my God, what was the last one? Oh, and a, a men's or women's meeting. So a book meeting, a step meeting, a social meeting, a men's or women's meeting and a speaker meeting. And then uh, Katya's question, Tim, uh, this is gonna oh. look different for, for me and you. So you wanna take that first? Sure. So Katya, um, how much time is dedicated to the steps and recovery per day? And what does the ritual look like? What a beautiful question. I believe the answer to that is as different as the human being involved in attempting to work a program of recovery. So for example, um, I begin the day saying, good morning, higher power. My name is Tim Meyer. I'm grateful to be powerless over alcohol. Please help me to become grateful to be powerless over all this other shit. And then um, over the course of the, and, and then I um, can try to read from um, one of the publications that I have either from the 12 and 12 or the big book or Al-Anon's one day at a time, the ACA big uh, red book, um, read something from literature that can just be a paragraph. It might only be a couple of sentences. Uh, during the course of the day, I really try to pay attention to what's going on in my body. Because if I feel really tense, there's some powerlessness going on and I could work the program. I could work steps on whatever that powerlessness might be. If, like I said, I'm flying off the handle, if I'm in the car and I'm screaming um, epithets at other people who aren't in the car with me, um, there's a, that's a good indication there's some powerlessness going on. So over the course of the day, I try to work steps when possible. And then in the evening, as I do the 10th step, that can be however long. If I include meditation as part of it, then it will probably be a bit longer than if I'm not. Uh, but again, it's completely up to the person and I think there's no wrong way to do it. Did you wanna say something, Bob? Yes, I, I'm, I'm right with you on everything that you shared there, Tim. My, my daily routine is because of a workshop I took with Herb Kagan. He talked about uh, praying with his wife every morning. Now, not all of us have significant others or people in our lives, so uh, the recommendation was to have somebody in your life that you could connect with in the morning, every morning. And Ben and I wake up and we look at each other in the eye and we say the, uh, my favorite actually third step prayer, uh, which is the NA third step prayer, take our will lives, 
guide us in our recovery, show us how to live. And then we say the ACA serenity prayer to personalize who needs the changing. And then we say the AA third step prayer as a reach out to ask our higher power for help. That's how we begin every day. And it doesn't matter if I'm traveling and not here, she's traveling, not here. We'll get on the phone and we'll do it every morning. And Herb's suggestion was to get connected with somebody that you can start your day off with in prayer. I had no idea how powerful a tool that was until I began to do it. And uh, then I will read something. I read from uh, most every day from Touchstones, the men's meditation book that has the same kind of impact on me as the language of letting go, which many of you may be familiar with. It gives me information which is almost exactly like the recovery experience of one person talking to another until the difficulties that are there can be identified and create the situation where the person with the problem begins to take action that they don't yet believe in. So there's tremendous value in our meditation books. And there's also terrific value in meeting attendance for me. In the most odd and obscure way, Zoom, which came into a powerful positioning because of the pandemic, I didn't think I was going to be able to maneuver around in that at all. I was very uncertain about it when it first started out, and I've grown into loving it. And the ACA Healing Fellowship, which I um, am so happy that I found along the way, is, uh, is a grounding container where I can go and and I can share safely and I can listen to other people who, because of the way that the home group is and the fellowship is developing, uh, is a safe haven for us. And we welcome you to come and visit us in the fellowship and let us know about areas that you feel that you have safe haven so we can come and visit you. Because the whole process is about this connection which we have, which uh, I, I never gotten or, or any other places I was whipping and roaring. <laughs> I may have had connection, but it wasn't the same kind. And Bob, I, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I rely on this. There we go. Today, I will nourish my inner martyr. This is called affirmations for cynics. For example, opened at random. I accept that I am alienated from life's continuum. Today, I will inflict guilt upon others if they do not live up to my expectations, especially the hidden ones. Today, I will set someone else up for failure. And today, I will research an obscure historical event. Later, I will refer to it in conversation acting judgmentally when no one knows of it. So anyway, I find that humor is a really important part of my recovery. And somebody gave me this um, because she said she saw the title and immediately thought of me. Today, I will nourish my inner martyr. <laughs> um, then there was the question, actually a couple of questions seem to be related. So one of them from Karen, how do you make amends when they've made it clear they want space and don't want to talk to you? And then, um, Caroline, uh, I'd like to know their thoughts on making indirect amends with someone that's too painful, that it's too painful to speak with, that is, for example, an ex-partner. So if, again, my opinion, but if someone has made it really clear, like, if there's a restraining order um, that they want no contact, I believe I need to respect that, especially if it's a restraining order. So 
I need to work with a sponsor in order to figure out how can I put into the universe, in universe something that's good enough that will more than overcome the evil, the harm that I did in that relationship. And I think it's really, really vitally important to work with a sponsor in that case. With regard to an ex-partner, if there's not the restraining order and if it's clear that the person has gone to great lengths to make sure that no contact is possible, then work with a sponsor to find out if the uncomfortability, if the discomfort is in me or if it's in the other person. And if it's in me, then maybe I really do need to figure out how to make a direct amends there. But again, um, it's critical to work with a sponsor in order to make sure that what I'm doing is clean. And what I mean by that is I don't have hidden expectations that since everybody knows they're assholes, they're going to fall to their knees and beg my forgiveness. That ain't gonna happen. And I need to be really clear that I'm doing this so that I can heal. And in a way that does not create the need for another amends. I hope that helps. Bob, do you have anything to say about that? Um, is this on when making amends? Do you recommend actively seeking out people? No, no, this was the, the last two. I'd like to know thoughts on making indirect amends with somebody when it's too painful to speak with the person, such as an ex-partner. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> being an extrovert is, is handy because I get energy from interacting with people. So I took a workshop that was specific. Uh, there were some specific questions to this question uh, that was called Recovery of Your Inner Child. There is a book by that name written by Dr. Lucia Capacchioni. And when I moved from the Santa Clara County area to uh, Cambria, I set up an office in Cambria and I'd been there a couple of months and I had gotten so much out of this uh, inner child work and a practice called writing with your non-dominant hand. Many of you are familiar with this. And this is something that was invented by this therapist, Dr. Lucia Capicchioni. And in through the door of my office walked Dr. Lucia Capicchioni, who happened to live in Cambria. And I launched out of my desk. I, I felt emotional and tears coming up because what I had learned in this workshop is that for people that I'm afraid to get connected with, or they may have passed, or there may be a very challenging connection. There's a whole set of guidelines. I'm right-handed, so, and my handwriting, by the way, right-handed is not very good, not very easy to read. So left-handed, I'm thinking, well, I'm not gonna be able to do this. And I was guided in the workshop to do it anyway, because it separates left and right brain. And I wrote out the amends early to these people. This is how I got connected with my uh, father and, and my willingness to then follow through and make amends with him. And I hated him, despised him. And I wrote a letter to him about the reality of my feelings with my non-dominant hand so that I could get the feelings up to the surface and to a level where I could then process them with my sponsor. And I know that the ACA Big Red Book says, made a searching and blameless moral inventory, that in discussions that I've had with some people that have been around ACA for a really long time is 
perhaps, well, I'll say it this way. It's not the way I do it. I need to get blame or any feelings or anything that I've got up to the surface where I can then not hold on to it, release it, because then I've felt it, and then dispense it. So that's a long story to say that the process of writing with a non-dominant hand is really helpful to get real about amends that I need to make. And then in the step itself, the language says made direct amends to such people wherever possible. Many times we'll hear in meetings the word whenever replacing wherever. And wherever is wherever opportunity presents itself. Whenever is whenever I get around to it. That's the way it was explained to me by my sponsor in the beginning. So it could be that I'm not going to make amends to some of these people if there's too much antagonism. And I don't want to do harm to myself either. So writing a letter, particularly writing with a non-dominant hand, I found to be hard, but very practical. Thank you, Bob. So the next question I think is related. When making amends, do you recommend actively seeking out the people on our list or turning it over to the high, higher power and waiting for guidance? Or for when the opportunity to make the amends is brought into your life on its own, which would actually be orchestrated through the higher power? I think, Bob, you just answered that, the difference between wherever and whenever. Um, I, Years ago, I was talking with a therapist about making an amends. And there was one, I said to her, I am never going to talk about this with these people. And she said, well, whether you do or don't, that's neither here nor there. The fact that you're telling yourself you never can, that bears looking at. So I, and then as it turns out, an opportunity arose several years later and all of a sudden there I was talking about this very thing with them. So who knew? Um, I really believe that working with a sponsor helps me to be open to responding to circumstances in ways that will allow me to, uh, make amends when at a time that may not be of my own choosing. Okay, Bob, why don't you take Paul's question? Okay, Paul writes powerlessness. I can only list and work on those I am conscious, conscious of get present to by what I am feeling. Have you ever used prayer and meditation to help reveal or get present to powerlessness while we are asleep too? Well, I can answer that easily. I'm asleep a lot of times when I'm awake. Uh, what, what I need, uh, need is a strong word. What I want to become more aware of one day at a time is being present to the layers of the onion coming off. And some things um, occur in my life that I'm powerless over, and I know it, and I can get cranky about that, and I can dial up Tim and, and hear him say some of the things that we've discussed today, like make my higher power bigger. Do I have a choice in the matter? Do I have a payoff in this? And then other times, I don't know how much uh, control there is. As far as actually being my, my own propensity to control is what I meant to say. As far as being asleep is concerned, uh, if I wake up on a morning and I have that vulture at the bedpost, then something may have clicked in during my sleep. And I need to pay attention to what that powerlessness is because if that kick starts my day, it's really going to be important for me to 
first pay attention to it and then to get it into solution uh, right away. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, things come to me in my sleep for sure. Mina, how long did it take you to feel you had made significant progress in your recovery journey? That is a wonderful question. Um, I believe that a lot of us have the experience of other people seeing progress in us before we recognize it ourselves. And I know that that was very true in my case. Um, I remember complaining to my Al-Anon sponsor, I was, let's see, I was living in Cleveland. I mean, what's, you know, what's not to complain about? Um, but I remember complaining to my Al-Anon sponsor. So I was probably four years sober, five years sober. Um, anyway, that the Al-Anon program says the family situation is bound to improve as we apply the Al-Anon ideas. And then I described this laundry list of how my family was still massively goofy. And he looked at me and he said, Tim, the fact that you're in recovery means your family situation has already improved. So I think that a lot of us are not aware of it until others begin to point out to us the progress that we've actually already made. So oh, Bob, you want to take uh, Katya's? I'll just say quickly that uh, I thought Tim was reading from my script because if I'd answered that question, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things uh, that I also have been taught to do is uh, to get right up in front of a mirror from time to time, look myself right straight in the eye and say, Bob, I love you. You're a good guy. And when I first was instructed to do that early in recovery, it just made me cry. It took a while for me to absorb uh, what was happening. Sherry F., I don't know if she's still here, but she gave me my first copy of Touchstones on my nine month sobriety birthday. And in it, she said, what a good job I was doing. And I was stunned by that because oftentimes we're making so much more progress than we realize, than I realize anyway. And so being a cheerleader for people in my life is something I really like to do. Okay, so Katya, um, your question was, how do I find a sponsor? I would like to find a sponsor. How do I find the right one? I believe that the way I've found sponsors is by listening to people tell their stories. And when I hear somebody tell my story, I ask that person to be my sponsor. Bob, how do you find a sponsor? Same way. Oh, okay. Yeah, I watched, I, I had uh, the um, wonderful experience of uh, meeting Tim when he was a main speaker at an Al-Anon conference a long, long time ago. And I was asked to do a workshop on something and I, I heard what he had to say. And because I was working with somebody at the time, it didn't occur to me to have Tim be my sponsor, but I could resonate with virtually everything that, that um, he was sharing about. To the point when he informed people that knew him that he was joining the army, <laughs> I wasn't the only person that absolutely freaked out like, what in are you thinking, you know? Uh, and so when he came back and I realized that I needed a closer anchor and connection with the basic program, uh, I heard him in meetings because he'd come back and was in Paso Robles. And I'd go over there periodically and we'd meet and we both share a, a high degree of liking of Thai food. So 
we'd go out and have the meeting after the meeting sometimes, uh, which is so helpful. And that's how uh, I finally summoned up the courage to say, will you work with me? Okay, um, Kim, just before we uh, get to the closing, uh, I got one question from one of our friends uh, around the globe. And um, the question is, in ACA working the steps by going through the yellow workbook and then the traits workbook is mentioned often and promoted slash suggested in some meetings. Also doing this with a quote unquote fellow traveler. What are your thoughts and experience regarding this way and model? Personally, I want guidance and to learn from someone with experience. I believe that a fellow traveler in this case is somebody who has been trudging the road of happy destiny for a while and can accompany, we can accompany each other um, so that it's not a question of the blind leading the blind, but that I as somebody who's been doing it a while get to learn from the newcomer and the newcomer gets to learn from me and we are in fact in this together because it's a one day at a time program and um, we uh, I believe that learning from other people's experience strength and hope is the reason we read literature by people who have come before us. So I hope that helps. Sometimes groups in early recovery will get together uh, where nobody has very much experience and everybody's new and they'll form uh, a group to do a yellow mm -hmm. study. I think it's more important to take steps and work steps than it is to not do them. And I'm also a strong advocate of having mentorship involved in a group and perhaps if you're choosing to form a group, find somebody that's got some experience that has worked the steps so that that piece of experience can be shared, not from a one up, one down position, but rather from a learning position as, as Tim suggested. And in this era of Zoom meetings, I think that's gonna be easier to accomplish so that newcomers don't have to go it alone. When these programs were founded, there was no other choice. And we don't have to make the same mistakes that they made because there are people who have been around who can um, mentor us, as Bob was saying. Okay, I'm powerless over my mouth. I'm shutting up now, thanks. <laughs> all right, so just so you all know, I just changed our chat um, so that if you wanted to send chats about what your experience was like today, you're welcome to. So you should have that capability now. We're going to go into our closing phase and then we'll stop the recording. Um, so we want to thank you all for joining us today. We so appreciate it. Thank you to those that have been sending your seventh traditions. We appreciate that as well. And we want to remind you anonymity. What you hear at this meeting is confidential. We do not share anything outside of this meeting. Who you see here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. Um, and with that, I've got a couple more things. One is we've seen questions coming up today about the recording. We did record our recording. We have our business meeting on the 24th. So it's another couple of weeks from now. And that's when we're going to decide how we're going to post it and get it out to you. So we'll send an email to all of you that we have email addresses for uh, once we know what we're doing with the recording. We'd love to make it available to you. Um, and I think that is it. So we decided today we wanted to close this with the traditional serenity prayer. So again, I don't know if you have permissions to unmute yourselves at this time, but if you do, let's take a moment of silence and then we'll close with the serenity prayer. So a moment of silence for those still suffering inside and outside of these rooms. Which I thought was good. All right. God. 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 God